Do changes to the Minnesota Human Rights Act put religious freedom on the chopping block? Renee joins Moses to answer that question and keep you informed. Will all Minnesota insurance plans and employers be coerced by the government to cover so-called gender-affirming care and abortion? That's what progressives want. Folks, we're joined by Renee Carlson today for a shorter, very special segment because there have been concerns raised about changes that were made to the Human Rights Act last year, uh, the Minnesota Human Rights Act, and more changes that might be made this year. And people are very concerned that there might be some serious religious freedom implications. Can you talk about how what those changes are or might be and how those might affect not just churches, but religious schools, any type of religious faith-based association. Thanks, Moses. Well, good to be here again. Good to be with everybody. Unfortunately, not great to be here under the circumstances that we're talking about today. But you are correct, Moses. Last year, uh, the legislature passed a law in which they changed the Minnesota Human Rights Act. They amended the Minnesota Human Rights Act to add the words gender identity. Now, um, back in the 90s, they changed the Minnesota Human Rights Act and they added the words sexual orientation. But they also added a religious exemption to the Minnesota Human Rights Act. So that meant that religious organizations, schools, and nonprofit ministries were protected from being coerced and forced to act inconsistent with their religious beliefs, particularly about human sexuality as it relates to sexual orientation. And of course, um, now as it relates to gender identity, it was always understood that religious organizations enjoy special protections because they are religious. It means they can act according to their faith. They can hire according to their faith and teach according to the tenets of their faith, again, because not only is it clear in the statute, but it is clear under the Minnesota Constitution, the U.S. Constitution, and SCOTUS precedent. So what just happened at the legislature is what everybody wants to know. There's been some confusion. Um, as I said, the legislature changed, um, amended the statute last year to include gender identity. Uh, this year, that um, came to the attention of multiple religious groups that the statutory exemption language which did not include the words gender identity. And we thought that that was probably an oversight and it would be a simple fix. So actually some legislators um, drafted a bill to fix this language and that bill did not get a hearing. So in late February, there was a hearing in the Judiciary and Civil Law Committee in the House. An amendment was proposed in that committee which would fix this language. All we have to do is add two words, gender identity to the statute so that it is absolutely clear that religious organizations, nonprofits, and schools are protected under Minnesota state law. Representative Harry Niska offered an amendment in that committee. Again, to make this quick fix, just add two words, gender identity to the statute. A few organizations, a Christian organization, ACSI, Islamic organization came and testified, as well as the Minnesota Catholic Conference and others. Well, unfortunately, that amendment was not adopted. And in fact, the chair of the committee, Representative Becker Finn, said that this, um, what we thought was an omission, was actually intentional. So then the discussion ensued, did the legislature intend to force and coerce religious organizations to subscribe to government ideology about gender, to mm -hmm. impose their view about um, the biblical lens of men, women, and human sexuality, especially, you know, I say biblical as it relates to, of course, a lot of viewers um, of Minnesota Family Council and Christians who are concerned about this. So there was a discussion that ensued, and Moses, it was, it was astounding to see um, Representative Finke as well as Representative Curran be so hostile towards people of faith. Their comments um, included things like saying that this amendment was disgusting that it was disturbing when the amendment simply asked for religious organizations to be recognized under church autonomy to be able to hire and employ and teach according to their religious beliefs. So again, we, we heard that in that hearing that this was intentional and that it was also not something that thought that religious organizations um, should even have. They don't believe that they should have these protections in the law. And that's where the concern has, of course, started. And Moses, it didn't stop there. 
On Friday night, the Senate posted a hearing for Monday at 10 a.m. where they were also going to hear this Minnesota Human Rights Act bill. So over the weekend, we had very little notice to prepare for a hearing at 10 a.m. on Monday, which would have been the last chance for public discourse on this significantly important issue. So around 10 o'clock a.m., we got a notice from the committee administrator that multiple people had signed up and that they were going to do a lottery system uh, for testimony. Well, that means that, of course, religious leaders of all diverse faiths may or may not be able to testify. I think this would be a really incomplete record if they precluded people from testifying. And it seemed like that was going to be the case. Later that day, we got another notice saying that the bill had been pulled, meaning they weren't going to hear it. Now, we know that this bill has to be heard in a committee in order to go forward, and we are saying that it must include the religious exemption um, in, in order to go forward to offer the appropriate protections for religious organizations. Again, this is churches, nonprofit ministries, religious schools. They all need to know that they are protected and can live and operate according to their faith in the state of Minnesota. Right. Now, people said, well, what does this mean? What is the practical implications? Well, we're wondering if this was intentional, will churches be forced to violate the tenets of their faith? Will they be subjected to scrutiny for teachings on human sexuality and what it means to be male and female through a biblical lens? Um, we don't know. Could this possibly be the beginning of a vicious cycle of religious organizations be um, being hailed into the Minnesota Departments of Human Rights for these violations inconsistent with the law. Mm -hmm. um, those are the potential things that are out there with this language. Um, and it's certainly concerning when we've also heard that the legislature wants to pass an equal rights amendment that also uh, might mm -hmm. have religious liberty on the chopping block. So again, religious liberty is certainly hangs in the balance here in Minnesota. And it is significant that people understand what's going on and that people communicate with their state legislators um, and also just those around them so that everybody knows that this is the battle that we are waging here in Minnesota. We are literally fighting for our religious liberties um, and we also need a lot of prayer for this. Absolutely significant to be praying for the hearts and minds of all of the legislators and the administration that's going to be making decisions about the fate of religious liberty in Minnesota. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Renee. And I should say, folks, um, that as soon as this happened, Renee was working to, I mean, sh she was involved beforehand, helping uh, ensure that, uh, all, as you said, all religious groups were able to testify on this language. But also, as soon as this happened, Renee drafted up a letter, which we shared a few weeks ago, uh, that you, if you get Minnesota Families Council's emails, you would have seen that. So we want, we wanted then and continue to want to make sure that churches and faith groups know exactly what their rights are and what this pending legislation might mean. That's why we're, Renee wrote that letter and why Renee is here today. So for every one person who's watching this podcast, who's heard from Renee, is like, mm, that might concern my church or my ministry or my school. There are 10 or 20 people who are not watching who need to know because they're involved in ministries or churches that might be affected. So my request, folks, is that you share this segment with Renee, with folks who are involved in churches and ministries across the state of Minnesota. We know denominations are sending um, messages to all their churches about this bill. This is not something that we are only concerned about. It's the entire right. faith community in this state needs to be concerned about and needs to take action. So faith groups, churches across the state need to be following this closely. Renee, what's your, what would be your final message to folks watching and listening? Well, I think pay attention. The next couple of weeks are going to be telling. And certainly if any religious organizations or Christian schools have any questions, feel free to contact us. Get a hold of us at info at truenorthlegal.org. And we are here to stand next to you to answer your questions. We are here all the way. That was a great conversation between Renee and Moses. Now I wanted to brief you guys on something that has come up recently that you really need to be aware of. Um, there is a bill that is being pushed in your legislature that would require all physical or mental health plans offered by insurers who operate in our state to include what bill authors call gender affirming care. Now, this is Senate file 229 if you want to look it up, but I really want to break this down for you guys because this is pretty crazy stuff. 
Um, this policy states that so-called gender affirming care is quote unquote medically necessary. I hope red flags are going off in your mind right now. So it basically expands provisions that were passed last year with regard to so-called gender affirming care. So this is just creating more of a bulwark for that. And it's really important when we're talking about this to note what the medical community is saying about so-called gender affirming care. There are experts in Sweden, in Finland, and England who have analyzed this data regarding so-called gender affirming care. They've analyzed a lot of data and they have concluded that these procedures and prescriptions have unknown and even unfavorable results. So therefore, what we need to think about here as Minnesotans is that the risk benefit ratio for Minnesota's children uh, and also just Minnesotans in general, do not fall in favor of passing this legislation. If all of these medical health experts from different countries are saying these procedures have unknown to unfavorable results, then why is Minnesota trending in a really bad direction? Um, something else to point out about this legislation that is proposed, and it has passed its first committee, is the fact that this legislation, while it does cover so-called gender-affirming care if someone wants to transition, it doesn't include coverage for Minnesotans that are seeking detransition procedures. So that's crazy. A really good thing to point out. Um, and then also something I wanted to bring to the table for you guys uh, with regard to this whole conversation is the fact that just yesterday, the National Health Service of England actually ruled that children can no longer be prescribed puberty blockers. That's a huge, huge win, you guys, um, because England's government has said that it welcomed this quote unquote landmark decision, and it says that it would help ensure care is based on evidence and is the quote, in the best interest of the child. I cannot state how big this is, you guys. This is phenomenal. England, it, England's government is taking a huge step towards protecting children. Um, their health minister, Maria Caulfield, even said, quote, we have always been clear that children's safety and well-being is paramount. So we welcome this landmark decision by the NHS. Ending the routine prescription of puberty blockers will help ensure that care is based on evidence expert clinical opinion, and is in the best interest of the child. So this really goes to highlight, you guys, how out of step Minnesota's progressive legislators really are with the data. Uh, like I mentioned before, this is Senate File 2209, and it has been referred to its next committee. That committee has not been scheduled yet, but we will let you know here on the podcast, on social media platforms, and on our emails as soon as it is scheduled so that you can send letters to your legislators urging them to oppose this legislation. Um, but really the bottom line here, and I, I do want to get Moses' thoughts, but the bottom line here is that forcing all healthcare providers in Minnesota to provide this and all Minnesotan taxpayers to pay for this is coercive. Um, as the global medical community has no consensus on the long-term effects and whether so-called gender affirming care is helping children, but also just people in general, including adults. Um, in fact, we can see that Minnesota is so far behind countries like Sweden, Finland, and England with the science. They're, Minnesota is not acting in step with the science right now. Minnesota's children and Minnesotan adults are experiments. They're experiments if they're undergoing so-called gender-affirming care. And we are a state that prides ourselves on being super in tune with science, and yet we're really behind here. So we are truly, truly in the wild, wild west. So get loud about this bill. Moses, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Grace, I think most of all, um, I'm you know dismayed by by uh, this bill that you're telling us about. Mm -hmm. I think I think I'm really heartened by the decision by the NHS in England not to prescribe puberty blockers any longer to children. I think yeah. it's it's really hard to overstate how important that is. This is the second largest English speaking country in the world. Um, countries like uh, you mentioned, Finland, Sweden, and, and England, those countries, along with the US and Canada, have been on the forefront for decades uh, of so called gender care. So, for uh, they, they've studied this for decades, they have decades of data. And that is what is underlying the decisions that you pointed to in, in the UK. And then we've talked earlier about how other Northern European countries have also uh, stopped or really radically uh, pushed back on um, minors receiving these treatments. So mm -hmm. it, is, it, it is, as you said, Grace, it just underlines with 
the thick marker, how insane it is that Minnesota's legislators are going in the opposite direction. And it really highlights mm-hmm. that this is it is ideological for them, not about the standards of care, not about science. And um, that actually is a good transition into uh, this other bill, uh, which yeah. I was going to t- tell you about and tell our listeners about which essentially is the mirror image of of this bill. They were heard in the same mm-hmm. committee. Uh, Renee and Becca testified uh, testified against these bills. Uh, we sent that testimony out to our subscribers last week. Uh, and people should definitely go back and watch Becca and Renee testify against these bills because uh, they gave legislators some really excellent points that should a- appeal to all people of, of who are... Uh, of good faith and who are not ideologically driven that uh, gender affirming care, so-called and abortion should not be mandated to be covered under private health insurance plans. So that's our argument. You guys can agree or disagree. Um, But yes, so the bill I wanted to discuss uh, is Senate file 3967. And uh, that had a hearing the same in the same hearing that uh, the, the bill Grace referenced. And so the bill reads in part, Um, This is from uh, line 3.6. A health plan must provide coverage for abortions and abortion-related services, including pre-abortion services and follow-up services. So my understanding is that uh, medical assistance, which is Minnesota's Medicare program, already covered abortions for uh, for very poor people. I'm not okay with that, uh, just to be clear. But there was no mandate that private health insurance plans, such as uh, most people have, uh, would cover abortion. So um, United Healthcare for, is the, uh, the largest insurance company in the country, and it is based in Minneapolis. And uh, so for, for everyone who has United Healthcare, your plan may or may not cover abortions. They, as my understanding is, they have some plans that do and some plans that do not, right? Uh, but the state legislators want to make it so that every organization that offers health insurance to its employees, such as Minnesota Family Council, and perhaps your employer, for those watching, must, must cover abortion and abortion-related services. As And then in the separate bill Grace just mentioned, must cover gender-affirming care. And, you know, we talked about the science when, when it comes to gender. The science with abortion is, uh, is just as clear, um, if not clearer, Abortion doesn't solve any medical problem. It ends a human life in the womb. It does not save a woman's life. It ends a child's life. It is not healthcare. There is no defense and no justification for covering that uh, barbaric procedure under a health insurance plan. It is truly... And not only covering it, requiring it to be covered, Moses. Thank you. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. Requiring it to be covered by a health insurance plan that is a travesty. And so we are already on the front lines fighting this bill. But we need folks to take action. If you have a moment to contact your legislators and ask them to stand up and vote no on covering, uh, on mandating that gender affirming care and abortion be covered under he- private health insurance plans, please do so. It doesn't matter what party they are. They l- need to hear and they will hear and they will will oftentimes be glad to hear from their constituents. So please take a mm-hmm. moment, Google who your legislators are and give them a call. It's even quicker than sending them an email. So those are my thoughts on that. Um, Grace, do you have, uh, uh, you know, you, I think, Maybe this is even more personal for you because you are a woman. And also, you know, I think we've talked about how abortion is the issue that really got you interested in being an activist, being in the political realm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, for me with this bill specifically, and of course, also with the gender one, it just it really hits me hard when I think about the implications it could have for churches. Um, I can't speak to exactly what would happen because I'm not a lawyer, but I, I think about that and it makes me really, really nervous. And of course, I don't want companies like Minnesota Family Council to be forced to be coerced into paying for these kinds of things. Um, and when it comes to abortion specifically, you know, my heart just d- does grieve. If, if this were passed into law, my heart grieves for the children, the countless children that will be 
murdered by taxpayer dollars and the women that would also be hurt by this because women are hurt physically and also emotionally by abortion. Uh, so you're absolutely right, Moses. Our people need to stand up. Our people need to get loud about this. And again, go to mfc.org slash subscribe if you would like to sign up for emails because we give you action alerts as soon as you can take action on something like this. You can also follow us on any social media platform at MN Family Council. Moses, though, I did want to tell our audience about our annual dinner in case they haven't heard about it yet. We are having Seth Dillon, who is the CEO of Babylon Bee, come in and be our keynote speaker for our annual dinner, which is on April 26th uh, in Bloomington here in Minneapolis. So we're so excited for that. Our, uh, you know, our theme is rulers rage, God laughs. And as we can tell with this legislation that we just brought to your attention, the rulers truly are raging. We have a lot of progressive rulers that are trying to push bad, bad things. Um, but ultimately, we're keeping the long view in mind that God, uh, God is not deterred. God knows exactly what's happening and he's got a plan and he's ultimately laughing at his enemies. So come to that event on April 26th with us. Register at mfc.org slash dinner 2024 to be surrounded by many like-minded Minnesotans to meet Seth Dillon and also to see Moses and I there. Absolutely. I'm so excited for this event. It will be a absolute blast. Seth Dillon uh, is um, someone who discusses the type of things we've been talking about on this podcast today, sort mm -hmm. of 1984 Orwellian things, and helps us see them as humorous. Not only humorous, like not humorous in a way where we don't take action to fight them, but also where we are just able to laugh at the at the the game that's being played and um and then be equipped to to fight against and and oppose those things effectively. Mm -hmm. Um Grace, uh it's been a couple weeks. We took we took a week off last week. So now I have to ask uh what have you been reading? Great question, Moses. I'm so excited to talk about this again. I'm actually pulling up my Goodreads to make sure I talk about the books that I want to talk about because I've read a lot, so I'll just highlight a few. I just read A Man in the Dark, A Romance by Doug Wilson, which maybe that'll be controversial because I know Doug Wilson's <laughs> a controversial figure, but I just read that and it's his historical romance novel. And honestly, I was kind of fascinated by it. It was interesting to read a romance novel written by a pastor. Yeah. Um, and I will say, to me, it doesn't feel historical, like a historical novel. There was a small reference to Gresham Machen, who was a theologian uh, that passed away. Um, but there was reference to him. There was a reference to some horses. But other than that, it didn't feel overly historical. So I would say it didn't feel like that. But as far as the romance was concerned, I actually thought it was pretty interesting. I didn't have super high expectations for it, and I actually mm -hmm. did enjoy it. So have you read that book, Moses? No, but I did read, uh, what was the other one he wrote, the other novel? Evangelifish. No, it was it was the other one that was even more controversial. It involved um, uh, I hope I'm not giving away the plot, but it involved someone being put on trial for murder for mm. uh, disposing of a sex doll. <laughs> oh, ride, Sally, ride. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh my goodness. It's yeah. That I, was funny. It was it was funny. It was really funny. I have to say his humor <laughs> is pretty hilarious. So yeah, I. It's kind of just fascinating reading the book. So then I also recently read Very Good Jeeves by P.G. Wodehouse. It's just in the Jeeves and Wooster series, which, Moses, have you read that some of that series too? I, I have, and I absolutely love those books. So good. It's just such a classic. Now, on my to-be-read list, I actually did want to say this just because for our podcast listeners, this is probably a book that people would love. So we talk about Abigail Schreier, Schreier a lot and her book um, about – children that are detransitioning. Um, it's called Irreversible Damage and the Social Contagion, especially surrounding girls. But I recently saw a book written by her that I think is pretty recent. It's called Bad Therapy, Why the Kids Aren't Growing Up. And mm. it looks so interesting to me. And that's on my to-be-read list like as soon as I possibly can. Um, so that looks really interesting. I'm also reading some other books right now, but I just wanted to highlight those ones for you guys. That sounds but great. But Moses, yeah, tell me what you're reading. I'm really interested. Well, I just finished a book that um, was kind of dark, but um, really interesting. It was by a Christian writer named Harrison Scott Key, and it was called um, something like How to Stay Married. Um, and 
yeah, How to Stay Married, the most insane love story ever told. Mm-hmm. And it's it's really dark. So trigger warning, guys. Um, his wife cheats on him, and then they reconcile, and then she cheats on him again. And and it's the story of their marriage and how their marriage, essentially, in his words, died and was resurrected, and how um, mm-hmm. through uh, uh, mercy and forgiveness they were able to come back together. And it's like. It's it, it's dark, like I said. Um, really interesting. I did cry. I did laugh. Um, people are going to disagree, I think, on whether he he did it very well, whether it was even a book that should be written. Is he just airing dirty laundry? Or is it a story that people can actually learn from and grow from? Um, and he's, he's a Christian, but he's not writing as a theologian. He's writing as a humorist. So don't go in expecting a ton of theological illum- illumination. But... Mm-hmm. I think I could say that I recommend it. Um, certainly, there's no uh, nasty content or anything. Um, and yeah, I think I do recommend it. Only for married people, though. Um, <laughs> if you're single, you can skip that one. Um, <laughs> what I'm reading now also is uh, I, I've, I loved seeing the second Dune movie. That was just a masterpiece. And it made me want to read the sequel to Dune because I could tell that the movie was like looking ahead to a potential sequel. Uh, so the, th- mm-hmm. the the next book in the Dune series is called Dune Messiah. And I'm reading it. And just like the original Dune, it has a lot of sort of Christ figure imagery, but also pushing back on that messianic imagery. The author was not a Christian. It's not like it's hostile, though, Grace. It's just... Yeah, hmm. it's just interesting. You know, it's also you pulling on a lot of Muslim imagery. Um, interesting. Uh, like the first book. Yeah, yeah. Like there's literally a jihad, you know, a, that crosses the whole okay. galaxy. You know, that's that's what – that's the next stage. You know, after after um, Paul Atreides wins the battle at the end of Dune, he then goes on, on jihad across the entire galaxy. So – Makes him a little bit of an antihero, uh, I guess. <laughs> but that's the plot. So is the author yeah. Muslim? No, no. Uh, okay. Definitely influenced. Fascinating. Yeah. Just sort of like, uh, so Dune was a huge influence on Star Wars. It came out like mm. 10 years before I Star Wars. I had wondered that actually. Yeah. So just like Star Wars, there's a huge amount of different mythologies being um, Yeah. Brought together in in Star Wars, it's more Eastern mythology, Buddhist stuff. Um, uh, that's sort of like the Force and all of that. But uh, Dune is very, very uh, Jude or Christian slash Muslim. You know, uh, there's jihad, there's a Messiah. So it's a very interesting mix. So I'm enjoying that. I'm also looking back at one of my all time favorite books, Master and Commander by Patrick O'Brien, mm. which is a a sea novel. Um, fun fact: When our our boss John Helberger retired, um, we got him the the staff. Uh, we got him a a box set of all of those books. There are twenty books in the series um, to keep him busy during his retirement. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I I also have the full series, and I am just going back to the first one, revisiting it because I love it so much. It's also one last trivia fact about Moses. It is my favorite movie of all time as Master and Commander. Wow, so, did not know this. Learning something new. Yeah, you know, it's so good. And now, Grace, uh, this has been, I think, I hope, I hope, uh, a really informative, helpful episode, folks, uh, where we discuss things that are going on at the Capitol um, and things that might keep going on at the Capitol. So you're hearing this before most people, right? And that, I think, I hope that's, I hope that's a value to you. So please do remember to share this podcast, as I mentioned earlier in our segment with Renee, especially that segment with her. Every church, every ministry, every Christian school could potentially be affected by that. And it's up to you mm-hmm. to keep your friends and family members informed about what's going on. And we'll and we're here to help with that. So um, I will close this out as I as we always do with a verse from God's word. Today that's John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So, you know, I think it's worth thinking about that for a minute. Jesus Christ says, I am the way to the Father. All world religions are about getting access to God. Um, I mean, asterisk. I don't know if Buddhism is about that, actually. Certainly, all of the other major religions are about how does the human how does a human become like the divine or come closer to the divine? Because there feels like it feels like there's an unbridgeable gap between humanity and divinity. And there is. 
And that's why we can't access God by ourselves. We cannot access God by, um, by praying to any other name other than the name of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the God-man. In himself, he has a fully human nature and a fully divine nature. There's no confusion or mixture of his divine and human nature. And because that is who Jesus is, he can unite what is human with what is divine. And that is how, that is why he is the way, the truth, and the life. And that is why his death and his resurrection, not the death and resurrection, for example, of Lazarus or anyone else in the Bible who died and was raised again. That's why Jesus' death and resurrection paves the way for us to be united with the Father and have eternal salvation. And that is just such an amazing, incredible fact that redefines our lives, shapes us into who we are as Christians. And so um, I'm really glad that that came up um, when I looked uh, when I looked this morning. So folks, thank you again so much for joining us for this episode of the Family Beacon from Minnesota Family Council, where you can get the facts so you can stand for truth.